Peter Scopelli that in a while you will see even uh, uh, through the, the, the webcam uh, is a colleague uh, working in uh, the School of Design in the Canon Gimello University, uh, specifically in the School of Design. And uh, I'm more than happy in uh, introducing him uh, because what he did and what he's still doing is really fitting with uh, uh, the topic that we are exploring uh, along the sixth edition of the Observatory Design Thinking for Business. More specifically, Peter is in love with the, uh, the role of design in imagining uh, uh, what will be the future. And this is, a, this is exactly the, the kind of content uh, he is going to share with us, uh, trying to share, as we have done uh, this morning, insights that eventually can guide us or can inspire us in uh, uh, figuring out what will be the future, uh, considering the transition that we are going through. And uh, considering that we are already properly seeing both the slides and even the webcam, and Peter, I hope that you can see as well, uh, let's say at least the audience uh, is going to listen to you. Uh, I'm going to leave the, uh, the word uh, to you, underlying again that as we have done this morning, uh, if you would like to make some question to Peter, you can uh, both, uh, let's say, rely on the mic that we will distribute uh, at the end of the speech, otherwise, the same URL that we have used this morning, www.pollev.com slash DTB23 will allow you to type uh, the question that you would love to share with Peter and even the uh, upvote and downvote those questions that you would like or dislike in uh, uh, sharing it during the Q&A uh, session. So thank you, thank you, thank you again, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, let's say digitally, the floor is yours and I'm going to listen to you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Claudio, for the introduction, I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and uh, most importantly for the Politecnico for inviting me, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, the, uh, the talk is titled, uh, Some Experiential Design Thinking for Alternative Metaverses. Um, I'll explain design with an X, what that means later. So it's it's not a it's not a mistake. Um, but we definitely live in interesting times uh, with rapid change, uh, much uncertainty about our collective futures. I think um, uh, if we go back to A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, written in 1859, we find uh, some similarities. Um, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of believe, the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light, the season of darkness. It was a season of hope, the winter of despair. Now, I, um, I think those words were written a long time ago, but they describe the times that we're in as well. Um, we have incredible positive things happening in the world. And I think there's ways to quantify it. Um, uh, some people have really tried to measure uh, what kind of improvement has happened. And so this is uh, Steven Pinker has sort of collected measures on 18 different uh, dimensions and sort of shows the vast improvement. Uh, if we look at the work of uh, Hans Rosling, he sort of helps us reconcile maybe the negative image that we have of the future based on what the media tells us and the political discourse. Uh, and Hans Rosling's work sort of helps us reconcile uh, what our misconceptions about the current times might be. Um, at the same time, I think it's very important to say that we're living in the Anthropocene. The impact of design, the impact of business, the impact of our lifestyles is uh, available all around us. This is a, a documentary made by Edward Burchinsky. Uh, it's also incredible, I, I think you should, should see it. These are some pictures that uh, Brzezinski uh, took. And so design plays a major role. We can see the impact everywhere around us. The product, services, and lifestyles shape the planet's geology, ecosystem, and weather. Um, and so this is a lot of responsibility uh, for us. Um, at the same time, we also have the sustainable development goals. And so 196 nations around the world have agreed that uh, by 2030, we're working towards accomplishing these uh, huge goals. And so designers are incredibly working in all 17 of these areas. And I think one of the differences that we notice is that these are, aren't the typical design problem. It isn't about releasing a, prob a product or a service. Uh, this is about making society better 
Uh, and so there's a challenge of what do we do now to accomplish long-term goals? And so th this is maybe a new movement. Another level of complexity is given by um, how change happens when you start thinking about larger systems. So this is a, a diagram by Stuart Brand. It's called pace layering. And he sort of talks about how fast different layers uh, change. So the fastest is on the outside. That's uh, fashion, uh, commerce. Uh, and as you get towards the center, uh, things change more slowly. And so as you're trying to work on these large uh, challenges, um, you have to recognize that there's different speeds at which change happens. And I think that is what adds some of the complexity to the challenge that we have. Now, uh, part of what we also know based on William Gibson is the future is already here. It just isn't very well distributed. And I know that specifically you all have been talking and working about the metaverse uh, today. And so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the metaverses and I'm, I'm using the plural here and I'll explain why uh, later. So the, the idea of metaverse uh, first came across in a novel by Neil uh, Stevenson in 1992. I think the idea became really popular uh, with a Steven Spielberg movie, Ready Player One in 2018. And um, in 2021, Facebook rebranded themselves as Meta uh, fully embracing uh, an idea of the metaverse. Um, but there's a lot of questions as to what exactly uh, is the metaverse? Um, is it truth? Uh, is it illusion? Um, there's different versions of metaverses depending on who is, is talking about it. So there's uh, a lot of plurality. Is the metaverse open or is it closed? Um, and so forth. So a lot of debate and not much certainty uh, about the metaverse. Um, there's, if you have been paying attention, there's lots of future signs about the metaverse. So for example, even the New York Times uh, had an article about uh, life in the metaverse. Um, my son, who's 10, is obsessed with virtual reality. Um, my wife uh, is very upset with me when I bring technology home. Uh, because she's afraid our son will get lost in, in VR forever. Um, I, I have to tell you, uh, I tried getting onto Meta's Metaverse with an Oculus 2, uh, Oculus 1, and I had my own struggles uh, getting onto the Metaverse. Uh, some of you uh, perhaps have the Oculus 2 and you've been spending time in the Metaverse. Uh, and so you have experienced it firsthand. Uh, another way to experience the metaverse uh, perhaps is on spatial IO. This is a different platform. You can go onto spatial IO with a laptop. You don't need a, a headset. Um, and actually at the Politecnico di Milano in uh, December, December 2nd, um, uh, Politecnico hosted the International Conference on Design Futures in the metaverse. And so, um, uh, Ana Barbara, uh, Professor Ana Barbara from uh, the, the Politecnico, myself from Carnegie Mellon, and uh, Professor Fu Ziyang from Tsinghua University were the three core co-organizers of this conference. And it was really interesting. It was my first time at a conference in the metaverse. And a lot of people that went to the conference were learning how to do a conference in the metaverse, how to participate. And so we, there was a lot uh, that we learned uh, from it. Um, now I'm going to mention a little bit about um, Jim Dater. So Jim Dater was a, probably one of the most important uh, futurists um, in the United States. And he taught at University of Hawaii, Manoa. And he came up with the laws about the future. And, and the first law that Jim Dater came up with is the future cannot be predicted. The future cannot be predicted because the future does not exist. Um, so this is a, a, a puzzling um, law to think about. So how do we start making sense of the, the messages about the, the metaverse and futures? Uh, I think the first way is to start thinking about what are future signs that we're observing in the world, if the future is already here, right? What are the signs that we're observing? And I'll point you to the work of Elena uh, Hittinen, uh, she wrote a paper on uh, future sign and its three dimensions that I find is a very helpful one uh, to begin. Um, I think 
a lot of the communication designers in the audience will be familiar with uh, Pierce's semiotic framework. Um, and so there's this idea that there's objects in the world that exist, then you might have a representation of the object, and then there's somebody that's interpreting the, either the representation or the object. And so Hitchinen used Pierce's uh, semiotic theory to try to make sense of future science. So here is uh, Hitchinen's framework. So there's messages in the world, which are the what we call the uh, uh, the signals in the world, world, right? Then there's, um, once you see the signal, the article on, uh, in this case, um, Wired, that's talking about Roblox and its metaverse, you might try to understand what is the issue that they're talking about? What are they referring to? And then as designers and as uh, managers, you're probably wondering, what does that mean for our, my company? What does that mean for my design? How is that gonna influence us? Right, so there's these three parts of future signs. You need to understand what the signal is, what's the issue that it points to, and what's your interpretation? How does it uh, influence your business, right? So earlier I mentioned that there was multiple versions of the metaverse, right? There isn't just a single one, there's multiple. Um, and so here we go to the second axiom uh, uh, from uh, Jim Dater which is the future cannot be predicted, but alternative futures can and should be forecast. And so we don't know which future is gonna happen, but we can try to anticipate what are the different kinds of futures. And so as I was preparing for this lecture, I thought uh, for the metaverse, what are you know, four different um, alternative metaverses that I could think of? Um, the first one I came up with is sort of imagining that the metaverse is very focused and consolidated and people spend long times of immersion in there. And so I thought of the Colosseum. So the Colosseum uh, was a place where there was entertainment. Uh, later in history, people lived in the Colosseum. So I thought that's a perfect uh, version of the metaverse where people, families are spending all their time inside the metaverse, right? So um, another version might be what I'm calling um, the double life. So maybe there's uh, a metaverse where you go to work. Your, most of your life is outside of the metaverse. Maybe um, you go to the metaverse to play, um, play games and so forth. But then there's sort of like this dual life. You have a life in the real world and a life uh, online in the metaverse. Another version might be that uh, it's a consolidated focus. It's kind of like a piazza uh, in, in Italy in which you go to the city square uh, for the market or to meet friends for an imperative, um, but then you leave, you go back to your home, you go back to your life. Um, another version yet might be more of a diff diffuse uh, um, metaverse. So there's maybe you go to the metaverse uh, to meet with your doctor or your therapist. Maybe there's some online things that you do, um, but there's these little islands that you go into and you stay there for brief amounts of time. So these are four different worlds I'm not um, asking you to uh, like them. Uh, I'm just saying these are four possibilities um, that, that I can see just uh, looking on two, two variables, sort of the, is the focus consolidated or is it diffuse? Are the immersions long-term or short? Or short? Um, getting back to data, he says, um, the third axiom is the future cannot be predicted, but futures can and should be envisioned, invented, and consciously evaluated. So I, I know that you're in a, a jam for uh, design thinking. So I think my question is, is the traditional version of uh, design thinking as Stanford slash IDEO described enough? Um, I think, is that version of design thinking enough? Um, I have some reservations. I think it's helpful, but there might be some other things that we need to think about as well. And so some of the challenges of traditional design thinking is that it tends to focus on problems now, whereas the sustainable development goals and the challenges that our societies face um, need, to, you need to think about now and the long term at the same time. Uh, design thinking is traditionally human centered. Um, I think if we look at the larger problems that society faces and businesses face, it needs to be planet centered. Uh, we tend design thinking tends to be customer centered. So, who am I design? I'm designing for the customer. Um, 
but we need to consider the communities as well in which the customers live, in which the products are made and so forth. Uh, design thinking tends to think about what's economically viable, um, but we need to think about what's uh, sustainable as well. So, uh, so this is my critique of the uh, Stanford uh, design thinking as it's articulated traditionally. Um, I'd like to say that uh, there's incredible work that's being done at the Politecnico di Milano. Um, I'm really in, in awe of the work that Claudio De Lera, uh, Stefano Magistretti, uh, Calibirio um, Cautela, Roberto Verganti, and Francesco Zurlo are doing, in which they're studying uh, four different kinds of, des of design thinking. And so I think this is uh, a very helpful and important information. Um, I'd like to mention another version of design thinking that's coming out of Stanford. And this is what they call integrative design. And they say this is a practice to tackle complex challenges. So this is uh, um, a new version, if you will, of design thinking in which on the top, you see that they have human-centered design, um, which is what we also call uh, design thinking. Uh, then they've added systems thinking, uh, programmatic strategy, and equity and anti-racism. So again, with this integrative design, they're starting to consider the larger context within which uh, design thinking occurs. So um, we could say that it, maybe it looks something like this. Um, we've got design thinking, we've got integrative thinking, and that's broadened. Um, the focus. Um, but I think there are still some things that the integrative design thinking framework does not cover. And so I've added this dotted line, and I'm calling it design uh, function Y. And so design function Y would have to address long term goals, sustainability, community centric perspectives, um, and uh, planet centered. So there's uh, design for, for values that um, it comes out very clearly as a need. Um, I'll recognize that integrative design talks about um, equity and anti-racism, which are two important values, um, but they're missing some other values. Now, I put the dotted line around this design uh, function Y uh, because I think that there's a question. So I go back to my teacher. I did my master's studies with uh, Richard Buchanan at Carnegie Mellon. And one of the questions that he would ask us uh, was, is it a fixed category or is it a topoi? And by topoi, he meant a place, a place of invention, a place of innovation, a place of new ideas. And th the difference between a fixed category is maybe fixed categories are well-defined, a process is well-defined and you can execute it, do it better. Um, but a place of invention, things are messy. The definitions aren't, aren't quite clear. And from that confusion is where new ideas come. So I think the question for us is, is design thinking a fixed category or is it a topoi, a place of invention? If it's a fixed category, it's gonna be a process that we prescribe and that you can follow. If it becomes a topoi, it becomes a place of invention. So we have to adapt it. We have to incorporate things that are missing for the problems, new problems that we're working on. I think the same question is for the metaverse. Is the metaverse a fixed quantity or is the metaverse a place of invention? And I think for your companies and for your design teams, this is a really important question to think about. Um, so are they are metaverses fixed or places of invention? But this question that uh, Dick Buchanan would bring up, I think leads us to another question, which is how might we learn um, in the metaverses, what kind of learning do we need to do to uh, address uh, the metaverse, to learn about the metaverse? And uh, this made me think of the work of um, Chris Argyris and Donald Schoen. So uh, Donald Schoen was at, um, one was at MIT, the other was at Harvard, um, but they had this idea of learning loops. And so, and they described three kinds of learning loops. A single learning loop, uh, the example that they give is something like error correction. So the, it's an example of the thermostat. Uh, if the temperature is less than 20 degrees Celsius, then turn on heat. And so if you were to apply this to design, it would be if there's a design problem, apply this recipe for how to design, right? So this is a simple version. Um, but for the metaverse, if we take single loop learning, it would be the metaverse is just something to be filled. We need to figure out what to design for the metaverse, and then we design it. Um, instead, with double loop learning, 
the example that uh, Chris and, and Donald Schoen give is you start to question the super, sing, sim, single loop actions. So it would be, why am I set to 20 degrees? Is that even reasonable? I know that Le Corbusier said that 20 degrees was a perfect temperature, um, but you might be questioning it. Why use natural gas to heat? Uh, I think with the current conflict in Ukraine, we're all asking that question. You might ask questions about what kind of renewable energy would be better? Um, who wins and who loses from our actions? Um, so again, you start to question the frame. You start to question what the metaverse is and what it might be for us. What would we hope for the metaverse? Um, but then that brings us to the triple loop learning. So how can organizations accomplish their goals? Um, and triple loop learning is really necessary for that. So for the metaverse, the question might be, what do we need to learn? What are our existential threats? Um, how will we recognize progress? So if, we're making, if we're working on the metaverse, how do we know that we're going in a good direction? How will we measure progress? And mo most importantly, since the future can't be predicted, but it continues, there's multiple possible futures and it changes as we make choices today, um, how is the metaverse continuing to evolve and how do we adapt to it? So more importantly, what is our strategy for thriving in this moving landscape that's adapting and changing? So uh, for, for the metaverse, I think the question is how might we continuously learn, explore and anticipate, right? And that's a, a triple loop learning. So just a, a quick summary of the, the points up until now, I think the first thing is you need to ask yourself, is our idea of the metaverse fixed or evolving? And this is the, uh, the Richard Buchanan question. Um, and then the, the next three questions are, what kind of learning loops are part of your organizational design strategy? Uh, is it single loop? The metaverse is something um, to accept and fill? Or is it double loop? The metaverse is something to question and shape? Or is it um, triple loop? How will you embed third order learning loop culture into your company and design team? Um, what is the organizational futures learning strategy for alternative metaverses? Um, I think a connection that I'm making right now, since there's a lot of pe business people um, in, in, the, in the crowd and managers is I would say that these three learning um, loops uh, map to the um, three horizons uh, framework. So short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So there's a, you'll have to consider them in time as well. Um, so now for the second part um, of my talk, I'd like to sort of say we've talked about the metaverse being something that is evolving and confusing. We talked about um, how learning is necessary. Um, and I think the moment in which you start to talk about learning and design, then we start to have to explore um, design, futures, and strategy. Those are the three uh, uh, disciplines that are going to be most helpful to us. And so for the design territory, how does design, futures, and strategy meet? So um, we've got design, we've got organizations, we've got time, we have strategy. Uh, but the we, I think, implies more than the designer and more than the organization. It implies the community in which we're situated. It implies maybe the city, um, the, um, the region, uh, the country, um, the planet, uh, the, the um, biosphere, maybe even the galaxy. Um, so how can we start to explore these four ideas uh, from a design perspective? I think that this is a, a method that my colleague, uh, Jen, uh, Jonathan Chapman and uh, Ming Ming Chapman uh, developed, which is the design tetrahedron. And you start to look at three elements at a time and they start to give you a, a different focus. And so I'm just gonna quickly move through these um, and, and focus on design futures and uh, strategy because those are the, the parts that I'm gonna talk about. So how have design futures and strategy how do they relate? Um, how have other people thought about these three together? And so I'll, I'll mention the work of Elliot Montgomery. Um, he mapped, he was looking specifically at speculative design and he was trying to understand the relationship between design, strategy, art, future studies. Um, and this is sort of the overlaps that he sees. Um, 
there's other work that is starting to try to understand what is the relationship between those um, different design practices and um, questions of sustainability. So this is the work of Karina Angelia um, based on Elliot Montgomery's map. And she adds a two by two matrix based on two dimensions. On the horizontal axis, we have incremental versus transformative attitude to change. On the vertical axis, we have normative attitude to strong sustainability versus non-normative attitude to strong sustainability. And based on these uh, values positions, um, you start to see how the different practices uh, fill different spaces. There's uh, other people that have reflected about critical design and design methods. So this is the work of uh, Elizabeth Saunders. And she was looking at research methods as they relate to diff different kind, the different approaches. So there's on the horizontal axis, expert and participatory mindsets on the y-axis design-led on the top and on the bottom research-led um, methods. And on the left upper corner, you'll see that there's critical design. So Liz went on to um, expand her map because th the field of design is constantly expanding. There's always new problems. And so we need new methods. And so here you're starting to see where design fiction uh, appears um, critical and design interventions provoke us about thinking about things. Um, there's others that have done uh, incredible work on trying to understand these different versions of design. So experiential futures, guerrilla futures, radical design, spe speculative design, critical design, design fiction. And this is, I think, the work of, um, Eliz of um, Bruce and Stephanie Tharp at uh, University of Michigan. And they came up with a term, an umbrella term called discursive design. And they say that these different kinds of design approaches really help us talk about things that maybe don't quite exist in the world yet. They make it possible to talk about design because they become physically instantiated. We can experience them. But what are the gaps between design and futures? So here again, I go back to the work of Elizabeth uh, Sanders. And she sort of says, traditionally, design methods have been about the present and the past. But when you're, because you can collect data about the present and the past, you can't collect data about the future because the future is fiction, it hasn't happened yet. And um, so she identifies this new space where designers that have the ambition of working on the future need to work. Um, how do we understand the future and understand the present? And what is that space in between? So one way of thinking about it, and this is something that I use with my students, is, you know, is, is, is design about short term or long term, or is design about form or social impact, right? And so um, if you're thinking commercial design probably historically has been about short term and form. Um, if you think about social innovation, it it's becomes more interesting because it's what can we do now that's going to help us accomplish transformations or, or new, new changes or even the sustainable development goals. What do we do now to get to accomplish these goals by year 2030? Um, there is the work of my colleague, jo uh, Jonathan Chapman, who does emotionally durable design. And there he's trying to understand how does form create long-term relationships with people? And how do you design for long term? Um, so he's doing a lot of work in the circular economy and so forth. And then um, if I think about social and long term, I, I really think the work of um, Terry Irwin and Gideon Kossoff on transition design, which is really trying to understand what's that image of the future and then how do we get there? Um, my own work instead is what I call design futures and it's design with an X. And here's the story of where the X comes from. So in 2013, I was teaching a class with uh, Arnold Wasserman, and we were talking about the new kind of design and the old kind of design, and it was very clumsy. And um, he told me, he said, look, if it's new, it has to have a new name. And I said, well, okay, what should we call it? And he said, well, why don't we call it design with an X? And I said, probably what you're thinking right now, which is why design with an X? Um, and he said, well, in algebra, you solve for X. Um, there's Google X. There's edX, there's um, X is an exciting word. I said, okay. And he said, on a treasure map, X max, max maps where the treasure is. So I said, okay, Arnold, let's call it design with an X. The idea is you take design thinking, you multiply it by futures thinking and you get this new toolkit that I'm calling uh, design futures. Um, 
Now, design and futures is being taught around the world in universities. Uh, I'm just telling you the version of uh, that's being developed at Carnegie Mellon. So here are some alternative scenarios for futures design and strategy. So the, the, the three that we looked at, let's dive into uh, design processes. So probably the, the most uh, recognizable uh, version of design um, that I've come across is the double diamond by the Design Council of the UK. Um, and so you diverge, then you converge, then you diverge and you converge again. Um, but if you see where it starts, it starts with question the design brief. Um, but my question is, where does the design brief come from? Um, and my answer to that is the design brief comes from the strategy. The strategy guides design briefs. Uh, there's incredible work that's been done on strategic design and design for services at the Politecnico di Milano. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Um, there's also another version of uh, strategic design. Um, I think the difference between the two is the one done at the Politecnico considers the organization, the community, the government, it considers a larger context within which products and services are made. There's a narrower version of strategic design that really just focuses on the organization. And this one is, it starts with settling a, on a vision, understanding the vision, then figuring out how to design what you're designing, orchestrating it, figuring out how to have the organization be able to deliver on it. And so, but I think the question that strategic design then forces us to ask is, well, where does the vision come from? How do we come up with a vision? And so I think this is where futures thinking really guides strategy. So um, this is a, a simple representation of a foresight process uh, from the University of Houston. This is the work of um, Andy Hines and Peter Bishop and, and Worrell. And so they sort of say that you start with a domain, you try to understand the domain, then what's the current state, then you scan for trends, issues, and you start to make projections. You understand what are the drivers of change, then you come up with uh, alternative futures. Uh, there's the ones, and you determine which one's preferred for you. And then you might come up with an integrated strategic approach. Once you understand what's the future that you would like, then the question becomes, how do we get there, right? And so, but the question that we still have is how do we mix um, foresight, strategy, and design? I'm gonna suggest there's three ways to do that. Uh, I think that the first um, is sort of the linear, you do your foresight processes, then you do your strategic design, then you do your product and service experience. Um, so visually, this is what it might look like. You go through the foresight strategic design, then you do your design iterations. Um, another way that uh, futures and design and strategy might come together is by what I call rendering scenarios. Then I'll explain what that means. So for example, in 2019, our group came up with a set of scenarios for year 2050. Um, you can download them online. Designers might help design the actual document that you that describes this, the scenarios of the future. They might make diagrams that help us understand them. They might illustrate uh, what those scenarios look like. Um, and, and this is just an example. So this is design making futures pretty is what I like to call it. Another way is um, designers might make artifacts from the future. So we read the scenario, um, but it's hard to imagine what it would be like to live in that future. And so another way to do that is you make artifacts uh, from the future. So uh, for example, um, these are um, artifacts from year 2038 that my students made in a class that I taught with Stuart Candy called uh, Futures um, for Undergraduate Students. And we, we got a sense of what that future might be like when you interact with these artifacts or you read uh, what they are. We also taught an experiential futures assignment um, in that same class. And so uh, experiential futures, um, you can create. So th this is um, a poster, an invitation to uh, year 2030. It's for a job fair at the School of Design. Um, and it's using AI. Uh, to help students learn what they need to learn and also to find jobs. So it's making the matchmaking between um, the university and the uh, industry is much easier. So as, as you walk into the room, there's this um, booklet from 2030 that explains how the curriculum of the School of Design has changed. 
uh, in 2030. Uh, this is what it looked like when you walked in. Um, and for 15 minutes, we were in year 2030, we were talking with recruiters from year 2030, and they were answering our questions. Um, so we experienced that future for 15 minutes, and then we could discuss it. We could talk about how we felt about that, what we liked, what we didn't like. And so it was a way to take something very abstract and make it like something you can experience and then actually have a strategic a conversation about. The, the third way that I think foresight strategy and design mix is what I'm calling short circuits. And so let me explain what short circuits are. So um, I teach a class called Design Futures. This is just background. I teach it with a flipped uh, classroom pedagogy, which means that students do stuff online, then they come into the class and we do the interactive stuff. Um, but since it's a design class, I added a third component based on reflective practitioner, um, which is there's a lot of reflection on what we're doing and a lot of discussion. Um, so practically, this is what it looks like. They do the online homework. Uh, I try not to lecture in my class. And then when they come in class, we work in small teams. It's a workshop. We take those strange ideas from futures and apply them directly to design processes. So um, learning objectives. And in the past two years, I've been working with a, a PhD teaching fellow who is, uh, his name is Adam Cohort. He's also um, teaches at the University of Houston in the Foresight program. And he, he, his day job is, a, is he's a professional futurist. And so I'm the, the design guy interested in future futures. He's the futurist interested in design. Um, and together we've been really focusing in on the futures methods. We focused in on 19 methods and what are the design applications of these methods? Um, so I'll, I'll quickly uh, go through these and, and give you an example. So uh, this is just an array of different methods and where we're injecting them into a traditional design process. Uh, and these are experiments that we're doing. And that's why I call it short circuits. We're taking two things that don't necessarily go together, putting them together. And sometimes the insights that we have are completely new. Uh, other times uh, we, we question what we're doing. So uh, these are some, I'll show you some examples of some work that they did in the Futures 2 class. Um, for experiential futures. So we took the uh, future scenarios from Arup uh, for 2050, there's four of them. And then we took the alternative uh, university speculative design by book by uh, David Staley, in which he gives us 10 different kinds of universities that might happen in the future. And we put those two together. So the students then have to create an eight minute experiential futures experience so that we can walk into a room interact with artifacts, talk with people from the future and understand what that scenario feels like. Um, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, this is the experiential futures ladder that Stuart Candy developed in his, for his dissertation. And so we use this as scaffolding for the students. So the Arup scenarios are the setting, that's the world in which the, the, um, the university future scenario is being explored. And the task that the students have to do is what is the situation in which we encounter that future? And what is, what is the stuff? What is the experience that we have? Um, these are some pictures of what those eight minutes look like. Um, this, the stuff that they made about the future of design education. So I think I, I've gone very fast. Um, so perhaps one of the questions that some of you have in the audience is where can you learn more about design futures? So, um, designfutures.org is a place where I'm making all my materials available open source, all the materials that I've developed at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, there's also other people that are collaborating with me. So uh, Professor Ana Barbara from the Politecnico, Professor uh, Ziyang Fu from Tsinghua University. Um, 2018, uh, Professor Fu invited me to, to Tsinghua in Beijing to teach, uh, I think there's 26 university professors there, Design and Future, so I was happy to do that. 2019, I collaborated with uh, Professor Ana Barbara and I did a workshop with her students. Um, so this is, a, I was in Pittsburgh and I was uh, teaching remotely. So this is a, a fun picture from that. And most recently, um, last semester, so in the fall 2022, I was visiting Professor uh, uh, teaching with uh, uh, Professor Ana Barbara, Niccolo Gobini, and uh, Francesca Multini in the ephemeral design class. I was teaching the design futures part, and then the students were taking these ideas about futures to inform and drive their designs. So this is super exciting. Another thing that's come out of design futures 
is uh, my collaboration with Professor Fu. So he took the Design Futures class that I developed, translated it into Chinese uh, for the Zutang X uh, platform. And um, he's been teaching it for the past two years. And what's interesting to me is that he's taught close to 900 students um, in two years, whereas I teach about 40 students a year at Carnegie Mellon. So I'm really seeing that to have impact in the world, uh, finding ways to teach it online is gonna be super exciting for me and for us. Um, so um, just the, the last thing that I wanna mention is um, in 2021 at the International Conference for Design Futures, we announced the Global Design Futures Network. And um, the, the goal of the Global Design Futures Network is to promote uh, des uh, design futures uh, methods um, around the world. And uh, so there, right now there's three universities that are partnered, but we're hoping that more universities will join our network. And we're also hoping that more people from industry will join the network um, to help us uh, apply what we're learning in, in, in your everyday work. So. Um, there's an agreement between the Partimento di Design of Politecnico di Milano, Tsinghua University and Carnegie Mellon School of Design uh, to launch the Global Design Futures Network. So this is super exciting, but we wanna expand the network. The, the point of making this network is to expand it and um, make the materials available to everybody that's interested. Um, so just quickly to summarize, uh, futures for metaverses are plural and open. Uh, explore metaverse futures signals, um, how might design futures and strategy mix is a question that you should have. Um, explore alternative scenarios for metaverses and future scenarios, renderings, artifacts, and experiences uh, should be designed by designers so that we can experience what those possible futures might be and discuss them and make strategic decisions based on that. There's a, a linear integration of future strategy and design. Um, there could be short circuit design processes with uh, future methods um, but I think the most important thing is help us make Design Futures a global movement uh, through the Global Design Futures Network. Um, so that's my, my summary for the uh, presentation that I've made. And I look forward to your questions um, so we can have a conversation. So thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Peter, for the dense uh, and insightful speech uh, that uh, I personally appreciate it, but I'm quite sure that even the uh, attendees who are here with me did the same. And uh, as usual, uh, even if we are slightly late, uh, we would love to uh, share with you a couple of uh, curiosities uh, in order to go even deeper in the, the kind of reflection that you have exposed to us. And uh, even if we have already collected uh, uh, eight uh, questions to you so far, let me see if someone uh, would love to uh, make a question directly to you. Otherwise, I would start from uh, the first one, or at least the one that uh, got uh, the great majority of the votes, even if it's a sort of evergreen question. And more specifically, uh, uh, sounds quite similar to how can we select signals uh, and more specifically how we can uh, evaluate the goodness of those signals and consequently uh, uh, distinguish those that are good from those that are bad signals. Yeah, so how do you distinguish signal from noise I think is a great question. I think um, one of the biggest risks is that you listen only to the signals that confirm the, the values and ideas that you have. And I think the risk of that is that then you'll be surprised. And so um, you need to listen to the signals, even the ones that you don't like. Um, and so the bad signals, you should still put them out there and maybe you cluster them together. Um, but then there's also the signals that you like, the signals that threaten you, the signals that um, you're excited about. So there's, uh, because I, I think the risk is that otherwise you prepare for only one future. And the risk is that you prepare for the wrong one because we, we can't predict the future. You need to always prepare for multiple possible futures. 
And that way uh, you can anticipate them and do all the preparation and thinking that's necessary so that if they do happen, you can, you'll be ready and you'll know what to do. Otherwise you'll be playing catch up. If you, ha if you haven't prepared for the uh, futures that you didn't like when they, for example, the pandemic, um, we were warned about the pandemic. Uh, um, governments didn't take it seriously. Then when it happened, we weren't ready. Um, and, and so that would be my, my thing is th listen to all the signals, but cluster them, try to group them in um, different categories. And what do they mean? Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the, 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 the answer. Let me go through even the second most voted uh, question that in this case is about uh, specifically the metaverse uh, that you have talked about. Metaverse uh, has become uh, a hot topic. How can we make sure that we are designing something truly meaningful and valuable for people in society? It's not just following uh, the hype of the new tech. I, I think that's a great question. And I think um, when I was talking about strategic design uh, that, that was developed at Politecnico di Milano, I think the approach is, is very strong because it's not just listening to the company. It's listening to the community, listening to what are the uh, larger, so what are the government, uh, so trying to look at the larger context. But I think ultimately you have to design for values. What are the values that matter? to you as a company? What are the values that matter to the community? Um, what are the values uh, for the future? Like, what do we want our future to be like? What do we want to be remembered uh, as? Um, and I think values, designing for values um, is, is the most important one. Uh, to be really clear about what are the values and what are the consequences of ignoring certain values? Uh, because if you don't have a goal, it's hard to meet it, right? If you're not explicit about why you're doing something, uh, maybe you'll be doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much also for the second uh, reflection. Uh, unfortunately, you can see that we are even a little bit late. I would say that we can give you with uh, a new applause. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And we really hope that uh, in the next occasion, we will have the opportunity to even meet in person. But thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time and for the talk that you give to us. So talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you very much and have a good evening.